Good morning. I love Rocky just sharing in that moment is uh, this, thinking about this, is God takes our past and if we're willing, just restores and refines and builds. And Rocky is a counselor, uh, works with recovery and addiction, and just so amazing how God has done an amazing work. Um, both here and in Africa and so many different places. And so I uh, thank God for uh, what he does. And he's never done with you. Maybe that's all you needed to hear this morning, is, is God is continuing to write your story. He is not finished with you. I have one more thing to tell you about, uh, and then we'll jump into Romans 15. Is that thing is, is a number of people have been asking about, are we going to do anything with the recovery ac- effort in Florida and the Carolinas? And the answer is yes. Next Sunday, we're going to take an offering, and we want to start with that. And maybe there's something more. You may remember Chris and Sarah Hovarth, who came here in July, talking with, uh, representing Adventures Relief and Recovery Efforts. They were in Florida previously, and it looks like they're probably going back there again to do some recovery effort. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by an offering. And so next week during service, we're going to take a special offering that all of it is going to go down to and through Adventures Relief where in the name of Jesus, they are serving and working with families and individuals and investing in neighborhoods. One of the things I love about Chris and Sarah is that they're not just flying in and just trying to fix some things and then running out, is that they really invest in the neighborhood and the people that they're with. Also, I want to let you know that every dollar given, we're going to match that. There's a first acre fund that we have here at the church that was set aside years and years ago to focus on crisis efforts in the name of Jesus. And so we're going to match up to $3,500 whatever comes in next week, and we'll send that down to them, and that'll be a start, and hopefully we can be a part of maybe sending some people and doing something more there. So next week, uh, just so you're ready if you feel so led to give. Now, I was reading this morning, and uh, two, recognize that another storm is forming in the Gulf. Maybe you saw this as a tropical storm is forming, and maybe in a couple days something else may hit Florida, so there's going to be an ongoing need. Also, as I saw that, I read, too, that there's all sorts of strikes in Israel and Lebanon and Gaza. It reminded of the Russian-Ukrainian war, the back and forth between the Trump and Harris campaigns, and just this ongoing conflict all around us, right? There is this, this battle all around us. And we have this idea, there's this idea that Paul's going to talk about in Romans 15 today of, of unity, of togetherness. And what that seems like is that it just seems like something that is just not real. And maybe we just say, well, that's a great concept, but it's not realistic in our world, so we're just going to go and we're going to try to win. Whatever it takes to win, because unity seems impossible. We can't have unity in government. We can't have unity in our schools. We can't have unity in our workplaces, in our community, or even in our homes. But what about the church? What about the church? Is unity possible in the church? I mean, maybe this is a crazy idea, but, but maybe the church is to be a light. Maybe this concept of like a city on a hill, uh, maybe something that reflects the ways of God, the ways of Jesus to the world around us. Maybe the church isn't to mirror the world around us, but rather to mirror the one the church is to reflect. Think of Jesus' prayer in John 17 before his death. My prayer is not for them alone, I'm talking about those who are around, his disciples, his apostles, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. The message is the gospel. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you have put your trust in Jesus, this prayer is for you, for me. This is what was prayed, Jesus prayed. That all of them, the followers of Jesus, may be what? Are you sure? It may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be what? As we are, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete what? So Jesus is praying for a oneness, a reflection of the Father, the Son, the Spirit, this relationship of the three, that the church, that the followers of Jesus Christ would be this reflection and that they would be brought to complete Unity, the prayer of Jesus. This last sentence. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How does the world know that Jesus is real, that the message of Jesus is real and authentic? 
Well, according to Jesus' prayer, it's that the church would be one and that the church would be unified. Yet, a recent survey found that 65% of Christians report that they do not experience their church as a place of unity. 65%. And you may be saying, that feels like me. Last week, we looked at what Paul had to say about disputable matters. Remember the the tiered system that was presented? Mike Bird, the theologian, he presented, what is a disputable matter? Well, he said, first, there's the first tier and second tier and then the third tier. The third tier is what is the disputable matters. He said, what is essential is the first thing, salvation, Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God, the one whose life was born, lived, he died, he resurrected. We put our faith and trust. This is a tier one essential reality for salvation. Then there's tier two, he said. What is important in faith in the local church, but not essential for salvation? So this may be things like baptism practices or communion or spiritual gift usage. Some things that Jesus is still supreme. Jesus is still Lord. But these other things, they may break out into denominations or churches or whatever it may be, but they're still on team Jesus. But team tier three is what is the indifference? What is the debatable? What is the non-essentials? What are preferences? And if you remember, I gave a list like political parties, Bible translations, in time theology, worship styles, celebration, uh, or the absence of certain holidays, whether they're Old Testament or things like Halloween, dietary choices, medical choices, schooling, use of technology, entertainment choices, things in the history of the church, and even for some today is, should a Christian dance? What proper, what pro- or proper clothing for a Christian? Drinks, sports, playing cards, cosmetics, theater, so on and so forth. These are the things that we so often argue about. And I would guess those who say 65% do not experience unity in a church, I'm guessing a lot of those are these tier three debatable issues, debatable matters. What we talked about last week was how do we keep the main thing the main thing, being Jesus? How do we keep Jesus central? This is what we keep returning to is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, we can talk about the second tier and the third tier issues, but they are not becoming the primary realities. See, Jesus knew something. Paul knew something. When Jesus prayed that prayer, he knew that his followers would not always agree, not always have the common idea and the decision that's made, respond well to each other all the time, would not always understand each other. He knew the human condition. I think that's why Jesus prayed for oneness and unity. He demonstrated that in his prayer. He demonstrated that in his ministry. And he demonstrated it around a table. He brought his disciples together around a table and they shared a common meal. We're used to this meal, but his disciples were probably like, what are you talking about your broken body and your shed blood? It doesn't make sense. What are you telling us about yourself? Now we, we know what communion is. You may have noticed the, the trays here today. Maybe you call it the Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving. Maybe for you, it's the Lord's Supper. Whatever you call it, there's a common reality in this. The word communion is this Latin word communo. This is sharing or participation. Like I said, the Eucharist is Thanksgiving. The word koinonia, which means community, is also fellowship. It is also communion. But at the heart of all of this is unity around a common table, a common meal, a shared experience. Jesus. Jesus brought his disciples together around him. And we saw in the last chapters of Romans and throughout this letter how Paul has stressed unity between Jews and Gentiles. Talking about laying your life down as a living sacrifice, serving the body, loving others, submitting to those that God has placed in authority, accepting the weak, living above and beyond disputable matters. Before we get to Romans 15, I want us first to consider Psalm 133. These are the words of David. He said, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in what? It's just good and pleasant. First, because it reflects the heart of God. Because it's who God is. It's good that way. But also, it's just good when you get along with people. I mean, right now, you could probably think of someone, name someone, that if they walked in here, you'd be like, ooh. Or you're at the grocery store later, you're like, nah, I'm gonna go down this aisle. Or just their name or the thought of them gives you this feeling of, 
King David in Psalm, he said how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And what I'm talking about is fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. What David is talking about, what Paul is talking about, is not people outside the faith. That's another conversation. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. See, so I have an incredible respect for people who will come to me when they disagree. I have an incredible respect for you who go to each other when you disagree. That you will talk about whatever it may be. That you'll sit across the table, you'll have a conversation with one another. You may not see eye to eye, you may not even walk away agreeing in it. But it's really, 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 really hard to hate someone that you're sitting across the table from. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, you should see the imago Dei, the image of God in another person, even if you disagree with them. There's a human reality, a connection for it. And what this is, is why I respect you for doing this, is it's a heart for unity. Now, the issues come when you don't go to other people, when you talk behind their back, when you talk around them, when you post things. This is where the struggle becomes. The disagreement may be the same, but the approach is the issue. And this is a heart for disunity. This is a brokenness that you're choosing. Recently, I was listening to a podcast, and they were talking about this phrase, the normalization of slander. And they weren't talking about non-Christians. Because that has always been and will always be. But what they were talking about is how Christians are mirroring the world and normalizing the slander of one another. See, slander is defined as this. Any derogatory statement, true or untrue, to diminish and or harm another person, intentionally or unintentionally. It's easy to do this when we're not talking to another human being. It's easy to do this when we just start cycling these things in our head again and again and again and again. It's easy when we offer a prayer request for a person instead of praying for that person. This can be, happen so easily online. Slander, the normalization. And it's happening in the church of Jesus Christ. But where it starts is it starts with a heart of judgment. It doesn't start with, start with a heart of compassion. It starts with a judgment, a disagreement, whatever it may be, and then there's this judgment that's there. And then it becomes out of us. It comes out of us. And what King David is saying in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is for God's people brothers and sisters in Christ to live in unity. And then he gives two word pictures. And I'm sure this is how you would describe unity if I were to ask you to give me a word picture, right? Here we go. He says this, it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe, right? That's what you were thinking when I just said a word picture, right? Yeah, yeah, me too. So this is completely lost in our modern society. But in the ancient Middle East, what, when you would enter a home or a place of worship or wherever it may be, uh, often oil would be placed on your head. And really, there's two purposes. Is one, it's refreshing. Uh, you may be thinking, well, it's just going to give me acne. But no, it's, it's refreshing. Like the, the point of it is it's like this refreshing of oil. And it is also fragrant, so it would cover up your stank. Like you come in, everyone starts smelling pretty good. Like a little bit would be put on there. Now, this is not just enough. This is excessive. It is just this pouring on where it is coming down over the beard and onto the collar. And so he's giving this word picture that unity is not just enough where it covers up just enough where you can exist together. Rather, he's saying it is excessive. It is a blessing. It is this complete refreshing reality. And the fragrance is, fragrance is everywhere. Then he also references the high priest Aaron. And the high priest served God and served the people. The high priest made sacrifice for the atonement of sins. He made offerings of peace and fellowship and thanksgiving. And, and in this, it was compassionate ministry towards people. And so not only is it this overflowing oil, this picture of Aaron, this one who is serving people, who is compassionate, who is peace-focused, who is giving thanks, who is atoning for sin. There's a beauty in this when we move in unity. And then the second word picture, which I'm sure you imagined as well, is it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Words I'm sure you said this morning. 
For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Much of Israel is dry. It's dry wilderness. And in broken relationships, in infighting and bickering, there's a dryness that comes from that. But what David is pointing to is Mount Hermon, where there's this green pasture where the dew would sit, and it is life-giving, it is refreshing, it is renewing. It is as if that was put on Zion, Israel. And there's strength from that. So unity is this directive from God. Now, I want to pause here for a moment as, before we get into this text, and you may be saying, Chris, is there something I should know about? Like, is there something simmering here at the church that you're talking to? Or are you talking to me? Are you talking to a specific group of people? No, 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 no. No. Not at all. This is the text that we have been moving towards throughout. But I think within each and every one of our lives, there's an opportunity for us to consider unity, to consider how we are either moving towards unity or away from unity as individuals. This church, I've been here for a really long time, is that I have seen so many different things in the past 23 years. I have seen seasons that have just been so hard and heavy. And I've seen other seasons that are just full of joy and life. This up and down, walking through tragic situations, joyful situations, death, life. But what I have so appreciated is a heart that's in this church for unity. Now again, please don't be confused. This does not mean that over the last 23 years I have witnessed perfect, uniform, 100% agreement in everything. If you've been here for more than like a day or two, like, or or if you're human, you know that's impossible, right? And as it's been said, if you're looking for the perfect church and you think this is the perfect church, it's not. And if you go to another church thinking it's the perfect church, don't go there because you'll mess it up. Like, just like if I went there, I'd mess it up, right? We're all a mess, and we bring our mess together. And we will never, ever, ever, ever be uniform, but we can work towards unity because it's about Jesus, not about the stuff, not about the issues, not about all this stuff. And so I think back to membership decisions, board decisions, staff decisions, the body I have witnessed you so often have a heart of unity. And again, I love even more so when you go to someone or I go to someone and I'm like, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And it's a supernatural grace that I think God has blessed this church with for the the 40 plus years that it's existed. And it started early with a culture that was formed in the prayer foundation. Paul said in Ephesians 4, He said, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So here's the directive for each and every one of us. If you're a follower of Jesus towards other followers of Jesus, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So as far as it's up to you, live at peace. We're not to be the source. We're not to be the cause. And if we are, we go really quick and like, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry, I sinned. Sorry, I said that. Sorry, whatever that may be. Paul said, make every effort. So in every decision, every conversation, every thought, is this working us towards unity in the spirit? And is this moving us towards peace? He continues, he says, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There's a lot of ones in there. The idea is this focus on Jesus, this common faith. See, there's this prayer and this teaching because Jesus knew, God knew that we're human and disunity creeps in and it divides. Talked about that last week. So really briefly, I want to fly through six things in Romans 15 that we are to learn about unity. First, starting in verse one, here we go. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So the first thing we're to learn towards unity is we are to bear one another's weaknesses. We bear their failings, their infirmities, their sin, their addiction, their sorrow, their depression. In Galatians, Paul says, carry one another's burdens. So often we're like, nah, you can keep them and here's some more. Like, how do we lighten someone else's load? How do we bear their burden? If you're strong, Who around you needs your help to carry their burden? Maybe what that is is 
is like, hey, I'm praying for you, or what do you need, or here's whatever it may be, groceries, here's a gas card, here, I'll be at your house to watch your kids, I'll whatever. Like, how do you bear a burden? The way you're not going to see a burden, the way you, you may be saying, well, like, I don't know what burden's around me. I'm guessing you're kind of inward looking then. You're not aware of the world around you. Sorry, that may be harsh, but deal with it. Is that when you, if you can't see the needs around you, you're just looking at yourself. There's no other way around that. There is such need around you. Right now, the person sitting down your row or in front of you or behind you, they have needs. Like, I don't know what they are. Talk to them. Get to know them. People in your neighborhood, in your school, in your workplace, they have needs. How can you bear their burdens? Especially brothers and sisters in Christ. How do you help them come to a place of freedom? Don't heap on. Carry the burden. Second thing, towards unity, build one another up. Verse 2, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Jesus was asked, who's my neighbor? He replied, anyone who has need. So your neighbor, the person that you are to build up, is a person with a need. Paul has already said to the weaker brother or sister not to cause them to stumble or distress them or tear them down. Guess what? People are hard enough on themselves. You are hard enough on yourself. You don't need more heaped on and you don't need to heap on others. We need words of encouragement, words of hope. You never know what that one encouraging word, how it could transform a life. How it could even save a life. I remember my youth pastor, when I was 15, 16 years old, I was driving in the car with him, and he stopped, and he said some encouraging word to someone. It was a stranger. I'm like, who in the world is that, and why'd you stop? And I remember his words. He said, I don't know. They might have been contemplating suicide, but I wanted to encourage them. Never know what one word may do. I'm like, whoa. Paul says in Ephesians 4, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That it may benefit those who listen. We're to build one another up. Some of you carry words that someone spoke over you at some point in your life. It could be 50 years ago. You could pull that phrase in that situation up. Those are words of death that were spoken over you. And this is what Paul is saying is, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. These words of life, or what we have to have, to build others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So how are you speaking life? It is so easy to speak death. It is so easy to speak critical words. So easy. I am guilty of that. You're guilty of that. But how do we not let unwholesome words come out? Towards unity, we are also to live like Jesus. Verse three, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Jesus did not walk with selfish ambition. He gave himself away again and again and again and again and again. And some of you have done that, and some of you have compassion fatigue right now. Some of you are like, I'm just done giving. It's just sucking the life out of me. I want to encourage you to go back to your why. Why are you doing what you're doing? What is your why? Is it for Jesus? Jesus was doing the will of his Father. Are you doing it just so you feel good or because you feel like you have to? We live like Jesus. The fourth thing towards unity from verse four is we let God's word strengthen and encourage us. Verse four says this, let everything that was written in the past, in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, they provide we might have hope. So here, do we allow scriptures to teach us, to guide us? Do we Let the word strengthen us. We have the words of life. We have stories of how God has worked in the past and and how he'll work in the future again. Yet we neglect the word of God. We're like, hey, we'll get that Sunday. Like Every day, there's this opportunity for us to encourage us, to us to point towards other people, toward one another. God's word gives comfort. It helps. It's an encouragement. We miss out on so much when we do not read the word of God. I know the days where I just jump into life, jump into whatever it is ahead of me, and I've not read the word. I feel it so readily. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's power in life when we read and allow the word to change us. 
And the fifth thing towards unity is we let God's power develop maturity in us. We may want to mature, but it's God's power that matures us. I love how the message translation speaks to this. Sometimes I read this just to get a different perspective. Is that This is how it reads. May our dependably, I'm sorry, I didn't even read the first verse. Verse 5 says this. May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you the same mind, the attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. Who gives endurance and encouragement, give you the same attitude of mind toward one another, towards each other, that Christ Jesus had. This is how the message says it. May our dependably steady and warmly personal God develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. I love this. First of all, Jesus knows my mess. He knows your mess. He knows the core reality of who you are. He knows the core reality of who I am. And he still died for you, died for me. He still desires relationship with you. And I love this. May our dependably steady and warmly personal God develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other. What if if the sign of maturity is how well we get along with other followers of Jesus? I mean, what if that that is the sign of maturity? I mean, the people that are easy to love and then the other people that are not so easy to love. Like everyone. What if that is the sign of maturity? In Philippians, Paul paints this picture. He says, hey, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, basically, like if you have any benefits of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he says this in verse two, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. And he continues on, just talking about how Jesus came and he served. But why does this matter? Like I can talk about unity. I can talk about this reflecting Jesus. Why does this matter? Verse 6 says this, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With one mind, one voice. It's this unity for the glory of God. And I'm so thankful for so much life that happens around this place. It is a joy. Sometimes I just sit back like a proud grandpa or a proud father and I'm like, look at that, look at that, look at that. So cool how you serve one another, how you serve the community, how you're serving the world. We allow God to develop us and mature us. And then finally, this last one is we're called to welcome and serve one another. Verse 7 says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become the servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, and that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. What he's saying is, as brothers and sisters in Christ, what do we do in light of disputable matters, in light of disagreement? How do we welcome one another in the name of Jesus? How do we present ourselves as a living sacrifice? How do we serve one another to bring unity individually and together? And I look around the church, and like I said earlier, is I see the welcome. I love the energy and excitement, especially as I see the kids' ministry happening. I love the heart of those who come and serve people at Lighthouse. I love the outpouring of love with Operation Christmas Child Teams, the commitment of care to mustard seeds, uh, the love through hospitality, through the cafe, through the welcome, through the next steps. I mean, there's so many different things. Our tech team that's so committed, worship teams, those who quietly go about serving, our prayer teams. There are so many things that are happening the people that go out and serve in the name of Jesus every single week in our community. This church is far from perfect. Far from perfect. But what I love is the heart. And we seek to glorify God and to try to keep the main thing the main thing. Do we make mistakes? Do we get off course? Yes. 
But if this is you, if you have this heart of unity, if you have this heart where you want to keep Jesus the thing, like you'll talk about the other things, but the thing is Jesus, is loving God and loving people, then I pray that you continue to invest and engage in what God is doing here. And then when you go into your world beyond here every single week. What Rocky read earlier is this end of of praise, this outpouring of praise. This is the response to the body of Christ moving in unity, being who Jesus is and reflecting it to the world. The last verse that he read was verse 13, and it says this. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him. That's my prayer, is wherever you're at today, that God would fill you with joy and peace as you trust him. That you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That that would be true of you today. Now, this keeps coming to mind here. So I've, I've said this many times. Is This is a, a perfect message where you go out of here and you're like, I have to become like the perfect Christian follower of Jesus. I have to reflect Jesus perfectly. No, you don't. You just take a step towards him. I've done this a zillion times. Like if our spiritual progression is A through Z and you're on A, you may want to be somewhere down and like in, but guess what your next step is? B, yep. And then C and D and E, it's this progression. And guess what's gonna happen? You may be on E and you're like, uh-oh, D. Or it may be like this, like, oh man, messed up. Guess what? Jesus loves you. Let's keep that progression going. So it is this movement towards Jesus, walking with Jesus, walking in unity, being quick to forgive, being quick to confess. And Jesus laid his life down. We have the opportunity to do the same thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So loved the world that he gave us Jesus. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's that division. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and life to the full. This is the life we want to move toward. So there's a table that Jesus gathered around. He had unity on the mind. He had oneness on the mind. This table is known as communion, the Eucharist. The Lord's Supper, it is a place of thanksgiving. It is a place of, uh, of togetherness, of fellowship. It is a place of koinonia where community comes, where unity happens. And so today we come to this common table with a common meal focusing on Jesus. Not on me, not on you, on Jesus. The tier one reality that Paul is pointing to Jesus, that we center on Jesus. Here at FBC, we have open communion, which means if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come. If you've been here before, you're going to recognize this, what I'm just going to say if you're new, hear this for the first time. We have pre-sealed cups in different locations, and we also have double stack cups with juice and bread. Whatever you prefer, take it. It's a common meal. I'm going to ask those in the middle to come to the center, these two sections to come to the center to receive, and then to go back around, feel like an airplane like person. Um, and I'm going to ask the outside sections to go to the walls and then wrap back around. And if you're here today and you trust Jesus as your Savior, you can do this in remembrance. If you are checking Jesus out, if you have questions, if you're whatever, don't feel obligated, don't feel like you have to because your person does next to you. And we're on this path to seek Jesus, to understand what he's doing in and around us. I want to invite you to pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for this picture of unity that you have called your followers to. Um, Lord, I confess personally when I have said or done things that have created disunity. Lord, thank you that you forgive. God, I confess that the times that the church has done or said things, this church or the church at large, that has created a disunity. For Jesus, that does not reflect your heart. 
God, I pray that today, us as individuals and us as the church here at FBC, God, we would walk in unity. Lord, we would focus on you, Jesus. Lord, we would lift your name high. And Lord, as you shared this meal, you invited people to this table to remember you, to focus on you. And so today as we come, God, may we come confessing any sin that we have in our life. Lord, you are a forgiving God. May we come rejoicing with what Jesus has done for us. Father, I pray, God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would consider what that means to follow you. God, whether it's them or there's someone who says, desires to say yes to you today, to follow you for the first time, they would confess that they're a sinner, that they would confess you as their Savior. Thank you for the work that you did on the cross, taking our sin, taking our shame, taking our past, and giving us this life and life to the full. That today they would proclaim you as Savior, that they would proclaim you as Lord, saying, I want to figure out and start walking with you. And so, Lord, in this time, we pray that you are honored as we worship through the receiving of this meal and through the songs that we sing. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.